This is Close Reads, a philosophy podcast with Mark and Wes. I'm Wes Alwyn. And I'm Mark Linsenmeyer. We are talking about William James, the varieties of religious experience on the Partially Examined Life. We just talked about this in episode 345. We can take this as a part three to that, perhaps. It's not a part of the text that was assigned uh, for those, those discussions. It is certainly not at all required. Uh, this was a part of it on uh, asceticism. So it's the value of saintliness is one of the lectures. <laughs> I think the beginning of the lecture might be missing in my PDF copy, so I could not grab the number. But let me get it out of the, uh, the, the table of contents here. So saintliness takes up lectures uh, 6, 7, and 8. The value of saintliness takes up 9 and 10. So we're, I believe this is near the end of 10 on page 361 in the text, page 378 of our PDF, probably approximates your PDF. Uh, this, these, uh, this book as a whole is a lot of testimony, a lot of quotes of other sources. And so that can get a little <laughs> awful. <laughs> and, uh, so we skipped all that and are going straight to some of his conclusions. Uh, specifically, uh, he turns to asceticism, and we had done Partial Examined Life episode 600, or, sorry, 262, Nietzsche on self denial. So we had dealt with the genealogy of morals, book three, where he gives, Nietzsche gives his sort of complicated view of asceticism. Of course, he thinks it's mostly bad, but there's also some value in it you know the self-discipline it is just you know like like most of uh, nietzsche's characterizations of the things he doesn't like there's a bright side there's something nice that comes out of the horribleness or at least you know something that is uh, indicative of the of the uh, the human condition our psychology that he'll want to stress uh, i don't think james is the the most careful reader of nietzsche but he certainly is aware of some things nietzsche said i so i had suggested we start at this point so are we starting at 369 slash 352 did i just say it wrong what did i say what did i just you might have said something different than what i have in my message here uh so 352 in the text yep sorry that's when we turn to asceticism. Okay. yep so the next topic in order yep paragraph um are you by the way are you coming to us from the parthenon or what is that <laughs> I looked for a Zoom backgrounds of churches. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, so what do they call what you're what you're in? What is the main part of the cathedral? Um, oh, I don't even know. I was, I was I continued the, to to Google nave? after I found this, so I don't even I didn't even write down what this actually is. Okay. The next topic in order is asceticism, which I fancy you are all ready to consider without argument a virtue liable to extravagance and excess. The optimism and refinement of the modern imagination has, as I have already said elsewhere, changed the attitude of the church towards corporeal mortification or corporeal mortification. Just preempting a future Mark pronunciation correction. <laughs> corporeal mortification and a suso or a saint peter of al of alcantara of alcantara appear to us today rather in the light of tragic mountebanks con men than of sane men inspiring us with respect if the inner dispositions are right we ask what need of all this torment this violation of the outer nature it keeps the outer nature too important Anyone who is genuinely emancipated from the flesh will look on pleasures and pains, abundance and privation, as alike irrelevant and indifferent. He can engage in actions and experience enjoyments without fear of corruption or enslavement. As Bhagavad Gita says, only those need renounce worldly actions who are still inwardly attached thereto. If one be really unattached to the fruits of action, one may mix in the world with equanimity. 
I quoted in a former lecture, St. Augustine's antinomian saying, if you only love God enough, you may safely follow all your inclinations. Quote, he needs no devotional practices, unquote, is one of Rama Krishna's, one of Rama Krishna's maxims, quote, whose heart is moved to tears at the mere mention of the name of Hari, unquote. And the Buddha, in pointing out what he called the middle way to his disciples, told them to abstain from both extremes, excessive mortification being as unreal and unworthy as mere desire and pleasure. The only perfect life, he said, is that of inner wisdom, which makes one thing as indifferent to us as another, and thus leads to rest, to peace, and to nirvana. Now, there's about 46 footnotes to this paragraph. Yeah, I think we can ignore all of, those? all of them. <laughs> so James uh, is the, very... The footnotes alone are 30 pages, just for that <laughs> one paragraph. James is very clear. This hardly needs uh, close reading in the way that Levinas or some of our other recent uh, readings do. But we could reflect on you know, where is he coming from? What From what point of view is this too extreme he seems to be talking as if uh well if you're you know according to all these quotes if you're properly spiritual then you don't need to stress the body i mean that seems like the default religious position as we see in plato and others is transcend the body go towards spiritual things the the, the suffering that is in the world is fundamentally maybe bodily at least in large part bodily it is the thing that tortures us so the way to go beyond that would not be to torture the body and and show off how how little you care about the body but just to not worry about it mm -hmm. yeah so he's anticipating a an objection from his oh so sophisticated audience uh, I have a feeling, right, he's going to have something to say about this objection, and maybe he's going to give a, a bit of a defense of asceticism. But this is the obvious line of attack, which is that I think if you were to get psychological about it, you might even say there's something a bit perverse because it seems sadomasochistic. Uh, for Nietzsche, the critique will have something to do with uh, redirected impulses towards revenge so or will to power mm -hmm. let's just keep going we find accordingly that as ascetic saints have grown older and directors of conscience more experienced they usually have shown a tendency to lay less stress on special bodily mortifications catholic teachers have always professed the rule that since health is needed for efficiency in god's service health must not be sacrificed to mortification the general optimism and healthy mindedness of liberal Protestant circles today makes mortification for mortification's sake repugnant to us. We can no longer sympathize with cruel deities, deities and the notion that God can take delight in the spectacle of sufferings self-inflicted in his honor is abhorrent. In consequence of all these motives, you probably are disposed, unless some special utility can be shown to some individual's discipline, to treat the general tendency to asceticism as pathological. Okay. Well, maybe he's not going to defend it. I don't know. Maybe he'll defend some version of it. But I mean, unless we think that this is just, you know, he's talking to his nice, nice English or American as he, he's talking to Americans here, right? No, he's in England here. Um, right. These lectures are given at Oxford. In any case, he's talking to um, modern. Edinburgh. Yeah, right. Edinburgh. So he's talking to moderns but you know i i think erasmus had similar things to say right the critique of the catholic church and mortifications of monks and rich you know over emphasis even on ritual all of that stuff has been around for a very long time before nietzsche before james the uh earlier the theme he, he brought up the, the healthy mindedness of protestantism and so lectures four and five are on the religion of healthy mindedness lecture six and seven are on the sick soul and lecture eight is on divided self and lecture nine conversion all these sort of tell a story about how religion is about our whole 
whole life attitude toward the world, emotionally engaged attitude. And while there are some attitudes like uh, he mentions Voltaire, just like, ah, who cares <laughs> that are sort of flippant ruling those out. It's the ones that are, are, you know, like Nietzsche saying, you know, having the, the love of fate. So this is a prototypically religious attitude. Um, grabbing the the world by the hands by by its by its neck and shaking it and saying yes you know that that is even romanticism is counts as a religious yeah. attitude if you just do that then it's called healthy mindedness and that includes theodicies that just deny the existence of evil the sick soul is the acknowledgement sort of the the flip side of the healthy mindedness is acknowledging that there really is suffering in the world that bad things do happen not trying to use a theodicy to deny it uh and so you could be sort of filled with pessimism and anhedonia and uh so this is all adjacent to religion but a fully religious view might be just simply healthy mindedness that's the, the once born or the twice born are those that recognize the suffering and do something with it embrace it nonetheless so nietzsche is actually still a great example of that that he like schopenhauer was like yes what nature fundamentally is is conflict but we are in a position that we should not like schopenhauer just be pessimists and say no to it and try to run away with with it but should engage it and that enlivens us so he would count as a twice born religious person so the question where asceticism fits into this is how the sick soul how that is expressed. How do you express that you uh, take seriously the suffering and bless the suffering is actually, that's part of the world and I'm going to go with that. And one of the ways you could do that is to torture yourself further. All right, you wanna do All next right. paragraph? Time. Yeah. Yet I believe that a more careful consideration of the whole matter distinguishing between the general good intention of asceticism and the uselessness of some of the particular acts of which it may be guilty ought to rehabilitate it in our esteem. Yep. For in its spiritual meaning, asceticism stands for nothing less than for the essence of the twice born philosophy. It symbolizes lamely enough, no doubt, but sincerely the belief that there is an element of real world wrongness in this world. Real, which is neither to be yeah sorry real wrongness <laughs> sorry real world wrongness <laughs> coming back to M mtv uh element of real wrongness in this world which is neither to be ignored nor evaded but which must be squarely met and overcome by an appeal to the soul's heroic resources and neutralized and cleansed away by suffering as against this view, the ultra optimistic form of the once born philosophy thinks that we may treat evil by the method of ignoring. That's what I like to do. Let a man who by fortunate health and circumstances escapes the suffering of any great amount of evil in his own person also close his eyes to it as it exists in the wider universe outside his private experience. And he will be quit of it altogether and can sail through life happily on a healthy minded basis. But we saw in our lectures on melancholy, how precarious this attempt necessarily is as in serenity. Now remember the Seinfeld episode, mm -hmm. moreover, it is, but for the individual and leaves the evil outside of him unredeemed and unprovided for in his philosophy. All right. No attempt. I mean, it seems like I summed up <laughs> right before we read that pretty much what so we what? don't just yeah yeah what do, you, what do you think of this just as initial reaction and sort of by comparison to nietzsche who also you know sees this self-torture as well it's an expression of will to power he doesn't necessarily i, I don't think connect that directly to uh amor fati or something like that like that would be his solution but he's worried about the same thing that uh james is which is that nihilism that we'd get caught in the 
in the in, in the second stage of the dialectic <laughs> that we have the healthy soul who's just kind of an idiot <laughs> really that you're not taking the, the evil of the world seriously and then you you catch the evil and then you become the sick soul and then you overcome it somehow um you catch the evil become the sick soul interesting well, okay, so what's he defending here? The idea is that there is real wrongness in the world, and we don't just want to ignore it. So it's all well and good to say we're not going to do mortification and use whips on ourselves, and you know, unless we're into that. But, uh, but that doesn't mean we should just develop what Freud called a reaction formation or just simply push down all the suffering and be fakely positive. Um, so in other words, we shouldn't try to become unaware of the world's suffering or our suffering. I'm what I'm trying to, I, what gives me pause is I'm trying to figure out how being aware of one's suffering is related to asceticism. This sounds similar to the kind of thing that Doc, that uh, Father Zazima was saying in the Brothers Karamazov as well. So, but he was talking about actually he was talking about our um, aggressive, negative impulses towards other people. We have to be aware of our hate. This is more about what what are we being aware of? I mean, it seems there could be a number of of reasons behind whipping yourself there could be a number of symbolic meanings of that uh i think some of them i'm a sinner i'm a sinner i'm whipping my you know the the literal self flagellation so that is about recognizing sin and your own sin in particular and overcoming that i mean i guess at worst it's just wallowing in it and it's not actually overcoming it but i think he, he is seeing this as a a coping strategy that is not just saying I'm unredeemable, but that I, that by by whipping myself I am redeemed, or uh, it could. But it could also just mean, you know, as I started off, as as he started off, I don't really care about the body, and I so don't care about it that I'm just not going to eat. <laughs> that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have material. Uh, I'm not gonna wear warm clothes. I'm not gonna sleep in a comfortable way. So all these things that. Maybe with a, not that much effort, I could be in some comfort. I just really want to show that my spirit is stronger than this. Uh, again, but you could see the temptation toward those things, toward comfort as sin. So it just depends on sort of exactly what your theology is. Yeah. I mean, I'm, there are different, there's a lot of different reasons for asceticism, and there's a lot of different manifestations of asceticism, right? So for Nietzsche, it wasn't just religion, but science nietzsche was here to tell us that you know we may think we've escaped ascetic impulses but they are insidious they're they're there even though they're hidden and of course in his birth of tragedy his critique of socrates and euripides um is that there you know there's a budding ascetic strain in that approach to the world so what is the, what is the source of that ascetic strain it could be right when you, we talk about self-flagellation i think one reason for that is guilt this idea that we are guilty so it becomes an overactive conscience or what nietzsche calls bad conscience and we need forgiveness and the only way to get forgiveness is punishment and uh we're not content to wait for god to get around to doing that we gotta preempt him, do it for ourselves, and show him that we are very, very sorry for being human or for whatever it is we've done for and for our bad thoughts. But, but there are other reasons for asceticism, right? If I'm a scientist or a philosopher and I retreat from the world into my laboratory or my study and uh, spend a lot of time with books instead of people, not enough time drinking and re doing reveling and being Dionysian. What are the benefits to that? Well, I'm less engaged with the instinctual side of myself and all of the unpleasantness that comes with that. So I'm just trying to think aloud about mm -hmm. uh, 
the different psychological motivations behind asceticism it's not just as simple as guilt and it's not um it's it's own it's manifestation if we take nietzsche seriously right the self-flagellation is the obvious one whether literal or what we do to ourselves psychologically but then there are many other more sublimated higher functioning manifestations of that tendency but i'm still not clear what james exactly is taught maybe maybe we'll figure that out but what is it that he what is it that we're supposed to not repress and and make sure that we stay aware of he says the wrongness in this world but so far that's kind of vague right and the, all the examples that we've given and all the touchstones you know at least what i can see in nietzsche are are individual so it's he said right at the end it is but for the individual and leaves the evil outside him unredeemed and unprovided for in his philosophy right the uh the the, the once born the optimist uh, so hmm. somehow asceticism is supposed to be not just atoning for my guilt but addressing the evil of the world in general as if you know i'm going to suffer on behalf of everyone that's a very hmm. christian sort of notion no such attempt to be, can be a general solution of the problem into minds of a somber tinge who naturally feel life as a tragic mystery such optimism is a shallow dodge or mean evasion it accepts in lieu of a real deliverance what is a lucky personal accident merely a cranny to escape by it leaves the general world unhelped and still in the clutch of satan the real deliverance the twice-born folk insist must be of universal application pain and wrong and death must be fairly met and overcome in higher excitement or else their sting remains essentially unbroken if one has ever taken the fact of the prevalence of tragic death in this world's history fairly into his mind freezing drowning and two men alive wild beasts worse men and hideous diseases he can with difficulty it seems to me continue his own career of worldly prosperity without suspecting that he may make that he may all the while not be really inside the game that he may lack the great initiation so how can you engage in luxuries well out there they're suffering well yeah okay so let's let's break that is that what he's is it just um selfish to do it pain and wrong and death must be fairly met and overcome in higher excitement or there else their sting remains essentially unbroken so i guess if we don't acknowledge pain and wrong um they you know and we just pretend to be complete optimists the they're still working on us psychologically in some way and uh, leading to some sort of behavior some sort of circumstance in life i assume that um where their influence is felt i don't know what it means to overcome them in higher excitement but um so okay the guy who's um so yeah being aware of all the death and all the evil in the world it's only with difficulty that um we could continue our own career of worldly prosperity without suspect suspecting that we're not really inside the game so we're it's fomo we're missing out on something if we're too optimistic if we don't look at the more pessimistic side of things is that the idea what are we missing out on we're well certainly the game i mean this sounds like what we might call virtue signaling at this point certainly <laughs> any excitement on my part or spouting of opinions or rituals or prayers or anything is not going to literally address the suffering in the world only a life of you know the sort of asceticism that would be just giving of yourself that i will be poor because i am in service constantly to everyone only that would actually be doing that but that's not what monkish asceticism amounts to that's not primarily you know saint mother Teresa mm -hmm. or whatever is is thought of as a saint not as, and this is in the saints chapter of course uh but i don't know if asceticism is is exactly the first word that comes to mind certainly there would be something suspicious about 
you know, we have our mega church that p- pulls in millions and millions, but our primary mission is to be out there helping everyone and addressing the suffering that we, we think that there's something cynical about that. Mm. Yeah. So higher excitement. Um, I suppose in the mega church you had, you'd have some good music, which would be, <laughs> Uh, I, I doubt it would be very negative. <laughs> it would, it's not like that you'd get on there and to be like mega mega death or a, a metal band talking some, about Satan. some of those excitements in the mega churches. I mean, it's Satan. It's it's like mm. let's scare the shit out of ourselves. <laughs> so that is kind of like death metal music. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> um, but what does he mean here by is he just talking about religion right so we're talking about asceticism and higher di- higher excitement looks can't help think of dionysian here and ecstatic rites and um the possibility that art or the aesthetic channeling things into that that that's a um possible way of dealing with all this stuff right so yeah tragedy um, yeah all all symbolic i mean <laughs> yeah so but but yeah but of course it's not helping anyone <laughs> we're just really we're just continuing to enjoy ourselves as best we can but um but anyway i just find it interesting this idea that if you're if you're too happy positive fake shiny then you're missing out on something um that you're not fully in the world that's okay so that's an interesting idea let's see if he does more with them well this is exactly what asceticism thinks and it voluntarily takes the initiation life is neither farce nor genteel comedy it says but something we must sit at in mourning m-o-u-r-n-i-n-g in mourning garments hoping its bitter taste will purge us of our folly okay the wild and the heroic are indeed such rooted parts of it that healthy mindedness pure and simple with its sentimental optimism can hardly be regarded by any thinking man as a serious solution phrases of neatness coziness and comfort can never be an answer to the sphinx's riddle he's such a great he's such a great rhetorician okay is that the whole paragraph that is the paragraph yeah and i hadn't actually thought of the sphinx's riddle you know it's just it's one of those riddles of but the the answer is uh, you know a person growing older and so if you could see the sphinx is real I, I is he really originating this tweak in the meaning of that to that it means the human condition the the human condition of suffering aging and death that you know most religions have something to say about <laughs> yeah the riddle is what walks on to on four limbs in the morning and two in the afternoon and then three in the evening the old man with the cane um so i don't know i don't know if he's how sophisticated that use of that reference is the sphinx's riddle um drools in the morning speaks with verve (laughs) in the afternoon you know where i'm going with this you don't need to (laughs) but he uh, okay so i think it is important to note that the idea is the bitter taste will purge us of our folly. So it's not that just we're missing out on something. We're not in the game, but there is a kind of folly to optimism. And, you know, it, it, I, I guess there's a lack of realism, right? If we're not engaged with the negative, it's going to come back to bite us in the ass. But, um, is that's a pretty ordinary sort of observation, but well, that is, I, you know, in, in contrasting him with Nietzsche, just in characterizing like what distinguishes a religion from a philosophy, because Schopenhauer's pessimistic philosophy does not count as a religion, um, but neither does the Voltaire's. Ah, who cares? That there's the 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 flippancy about it, and so. Nietzsche's insistence that science be gay seems to say that it is not 
he's not going to, he is against the religious spirit in some strong way, even though what he is recommending is very much religion. It has this higher ecstasy that acknowledges and overcomes suffering and our place in the world, uh, you know, shooting for the Ubermensch or whatever, whatever we're doing. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, do, I wonder if the, uh, the, the insistence on the, uh, the cheerfulness of it is somehow, a would be a critique of James's view that it has to be solemn in some way, or that okay, this is just a borderline case that there, there's Nietzsche is trying to trying to get what's good out of out of the religious point of view without actually it being religion. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. But I, I think we need a T-shirt that says "Shooting for the Ubermensch." <laughs> <laughs> I think you coined a new. A new slogan. It's shooting for the Uber Mitch. Probably won't get there, but I'm trying. I mean, is that like gunning for the Buddha? Is that like the uh Oh, is the, that a phrase? When you meet the Buddha on the road, slay the Buddha. When you meet <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a different <laughs> interpretation there. Yes. In these remarks, I am leaning only upon mankind's common instinct for reality, which in point of fact has always held the world to be essentially a theater for heroism. In heroism, we feel life's supreme, life supreme mystery is hidden. We tolerate no one who has no capacity, whatever, for it in any direction. On the other hand, no matter what a man's frailties otherwise may be, if he's willing to risk death, and still more, if he suffer it heroically in the service he has chosen, the fact consecrates him forever. Inferior to ourselves uh, in this or that way, if we cling to life and he is able to Quote, to fling it away like a flower, unquote, as carrying nothing for it, we account him in the deepest way our born superior. Each of us in his own person feels that a high-hearted indifference to life would expiate all his shortcomings. All right. Why are we talking about heroism all of a sudden? Um, the wild, okay, the previous paragraph, the wild and heroic are indeed rooted parts of it such rooted parts of it that healthy mindedness pure and simple okay so healthy mindedness uh, is in the previous paragraph in contrast to the wild and the heroic uh yes so Hel healthy mindedness us... is like the last man i think if we're going to keep yeah. the mm. simple right. healthy the mindedness yeah okay so he's calling us to a sort of heroism in in trying to preserve what's good about the ascetic uh we're gonna get rid of the whips and the self-flagellation and we're gonna put on some armor and go out go out riding um are you sure he's advocating here or is he but, just well maybe okay yeah people so admire the ascetic because it smacks of the heroic i am leaning upon mankind's common instinct for reality which in point of fact has always held the world to be Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I'm now you have me confused whether it, I, I don't know, know that he's not endorsing it. Will he endorse it to some degree? Yeah. What, what does it mean to in, in heroism, we feel life's su supreme mystery is hidden. Oh, okay. Sorry. I was thinking from heroism. In other words, being heroic is very shallow and you're not paying attention to the mystery. No, it's actually heroism is, is how to, yeah how to solve the mystery. Yeah. So I, yeah, that's why I, I was associating heroism with this more religious point of view, the more ascetic point of view, um, which he's trying to preserve to some degree, not of course, in its full self-flagellating degree. So no matter what a man's frailties otherwise may be, um, he is concentrated, consecrated by his willingness to, risk death he is our born superior if he's ready to what, throw away his life so i right now he's just talking about the quote unquote mankind's common instinct the way the average person celebrates heroism so it's unclear if he's going to come out fully pro <laughs> um but it seems like he's leaning in that direction i'm picturing an improv scene <laughs> that I will not subject you to, but just of the, the, the point being you, you spend so much time watching 
Captain America and, and Iron Man and Thor. Do you know who the first for superhero was? It was Jesus. <laughs> Not historically accurate. We can talk about the Homeric heroes and all that stuff, but I can see that being a, <laughs> a strategy, a youth pastor might take. What is Jesus's superhero power? I mean, he turned water into wine. He I know. All this stuff, you healing know, the you sick know. and all that. But really? But can you put that in a superhero movie? Is that going to work? <laughs> he rose from, he flew once. <laughs> okay. Walking on water is promising, but there's probably several superheroes who do that. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. Is just as good as that. That so seems, that seems taboo. Like, is there really, there's no Spider-Man scene of him. Like, look at me. I'm walking on water. I got wet, you know, or, or I'm uh, a spider. So the surface tension is such that I can actually, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even the ice, ice man, like, well, I'd, I'm technically not walking on water. I converted it to ice first. Don't, don't, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. I'm um, flying above the water with my flying feet. All right, let's keep going. If he had a surfboard, it would be cool. But anyway, um, <laughs> is it my turn? I think so. I think it is. The metaphysical mystery thus recognized by common sense that he who feeds on death that feeds on men possesses life super eminently and excellently and meets best the secret secret demands of the universe is the truth of which asceticism has been the faithful champion the folly of the cross so inexplicable by the intellect has yet its indestructible vital meaning all right so he does seem pro heroism here feeding on the death that feeds on men i'm mm. i'm fighting back for you against the the harsh realities of life by dying in your stead or whatever um the metaphysical mystery which is which is recognized by common sense which which he takes to be the recognition of heroism and the willingness to die Okay, so our, our willingness to throw away our life and risk death, only in that do we possess life super eminently and excellently. So that's an interesting paradox. To fully live, we must um, stop being afraid of dying. It sounds kind of trite when you put it that way, but anyway... Well, and of course, Nietzsche says uh, a bunch of things like that, too. You know, the way that he exalts war and being challenged and overcoming um, is just all about basically that thing. Um, so the folly of the cross, so inexplicable by the intellect, right? So there he's in the position of someone who, the anti-religious person who can't comprehend Christianity, Um Right. This is this is very much an apologetics. He's very he had very much read Erasmus's in praise of folly. <laughs> <laughs> right there, you go. But it uh, so there's an indestructible vital meaning to the cross. So Christ's willingness to sacrifice himself, which is an essentially an ascetic act, is is heroic. I'm still not quite putting it all together. I'm not not quite. Do you, do you know what I mean? Let's, I think we should just keep going. Um, okay. Representatively then and symbolically and apart from the vagaries into which the unenlightened intellect of former times may have let it wander, asceticism must, I believe, be acknowledged to go with the profounder way of handling the gift of existence. Naturalistic optimism is mere syllabub and flattery and sponge cake in comparison <laughs> the practical course of action for us as religious men would therefore it seems to me not be simply to turn our backs upon the ascetic impulse as most of us today turn them but rather to discover some outlet for it of which the fruits in the way of privation and hardship might be objectively useful the older monastic asceticism occupied itself with pathetic futilities or terminated in the in the mere egotism of the individual increasing its his own perfection so he is critical of the monkish asceticism mm -hmm. but it is is it not possible for us to discard most of these older forms of mortification and yet find saner channels for the heroism which inspired them mark how do you channel your ascetic heroism on a daily basis 
What's I mean, your practice? I, I feel like I should just read the examples in the next paragraph. Let me just keep going. All right, does, not, yeah, good. does not, for example, the worship of material luxury and wealth, which constitutes so large a portion of the spirit of our age, make somewhat for effeminacy, effeminacy and unmanliness. Is not the exclusively sympathetic and facetious way in which most children are brought up today so diff different from the education of 100 years ago, especially in evangelical circles, in danger, in spite of its many advantages, of developing a certain trashiness of fiber? Are there, <laughs> are there not here about some points of application for a renovated and revised ascetic discipline? So yeah, We're being today, too lax with these kids today. <laughs> Um, yes, the contemporary variety of that would be, yeah, uh, there's not much that's ascetic about TikTok scrolling. It's for the very opposite of asceticism. It's immediate gratification at every single moment. If you could, you know, if you could get down to a very fine grain, it's like the calculus of gratification. Each infinitesimal moment can, can be made to respond to your latest whim, but not, um, not if you think most of the TikToks are lame and you're just digging through for that nugget not, of gold. Though. They're they're freaking amazing. The algorithm is perfect. It is just one I I crack after I guess I another. I have China monitoring. I don't look at it. I already have a problem with Twitter. So, <laughs> um, but it okay. So what <laughs> what is he saying here? Now now we're learning that um, okay. We need ways to channel from the previous paragraph, channel our asceticism. Natural optimism is syllabub, sponge cake, and uh, uh, boiled peanuts, and um, <laughs> other things you find at fairs or something. Um, but so we don't return. We find outlets for our ascetic impulses. There, these are kind of heroic outlets of some sort. I still don't know what the what the uh, specific example would be. Right, having a less trashy education is that heroic is that ascetic? well you just asked what is my way of channeling it and i think this this death march through the history of philosophy <laughs> and, good point. i mean it is so heroic, i think it is yeah. it is kind of what nietzsche has been saying of the scientific discipline or the scholar's discipline or the discipline towards truth or any number of things that just keep you from just pursuing the 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 whims of the moment uh even practicing hard at an instrument whatever working hard uh at your physical exercise routine all these would be expressions of self-discipline and hence asceticism asceticism and and heroism against mere uh the the flabby uh inertia but but nothing is harder and more her heroic than trying to gaslight a bunch of people into thinking philosophy is interesting, <laughs> which has been Can't a tremendous amount of work for us over 15 years. <laughs> I, I guess that's the thing with close reads is that they can tell they we're, we're, we're reading it to them line by line. If we just tell them, Oh, that cot is so interesting. Let me describe you all these interesting ideas. And then they actually get to the cot and they're like, Oh my God, how do you get more? How do you get through more than two pages of this? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. See, I think this would be funner in all honesty to listen to, but, um, but anyway, yes, ascetic impulses, right? Yeah. So, so I think maybe I'm a little bit vindicated again. We should, we should have a point system for like our predictions of what comes from the rest of the reading. Cause I was, I was wondering if this would go into the aesthetic, right? And that is partly Nietzsche's solution. Um, we really are talking about sublimation. We are talking about constructive uses of these impulses and and usually we're thinking about redirection of aggressive or libidinal impulses right here it's a redirection of masochism maybe or you know or whatever you want to take asceticism to be but it's a self-directed impulse um you know it could be self-destruction if you want to be very Freudian about it, um, death drive, but you could, but, uh, it, however you think about it, you know, right. It is, it is a kind of impulse. There's a self punishment in it, which, which again, I don't think we can get away from its relationship to guilt and to conscience and to morality. Um, 
but we can do something with that more than chastise ourselves, <laughs> speed up on ourselves, say, why did you do that wrong thing? Don't say you did that wrong thing. Write a novel about it. I'm trying to remember uh, Kierkegaard talking about saintliness, and I think it was more in the context of it not being that serious, <laughs> of, of being from the aesthetic point of view, saying, oh, I'm going to become a saint and getting all worked up and, and that it's just... It's one more sort of artistic way of, or, you know, part of the aesthetic life of trying to squeeze some juice to, to out of life to avoid boredom. Whereas what you should do <laughs> is straighten yourself out so that you can, you don't, you don't need such extreme measures. Yeah. Well, hopefully it doesn't involve being ready to sacrifice your only son <laughs> uh, or back a station wagon full of your kids into a pond and say, God made me do it. God stops me right before I did it. <clears throat> so yeah, radical, I, I guess a radical personal engagement with faith. I, yeah. Someone like Kierkegaard is, is not so satisfied with, abstract conceptions of God as in the Hegelian conception or the aestheticization of the religious or even moralization, right? Morality is not good enough for Kierkegaard. Um, so I think, yeah, this sort of apology, I think it's a good point that this sort of apologetics that James is doing would be very vulnerable to that sort of critique. All right. Shall I? Yeah. Many of you would recognize such dangers, but would point to athletics, militarism, and individual and national enterprise and adventure as rem as the remedies. Of course, well, you talked about athletics, but I don't know. I think we <laughs> talked about our stint in the army. Um, these contemporary ideals are quite as remarkable for the energy with which they make for heroic standards of life as contemporary religion is remarkable for the way in which it neglects them. War and adventure assuredly keep all who engage in them from treating themselves too tenderly. They demand. I, I actually do want to. I do want to read the the footnote for number okay. two there. Uh, when a church has has to be run by oysters, ice cream, and fun, I read an American religious paper. You may be sure it is running away from Christ. Such, if one may judge by appearances, is the present plight of many of our churches. <laughs> oysters, ice cream, and fun. Well, you got to bribe. You need some sort of bribery to get people. I mean, I, I've never so been boring given otherwise a little <laughs> cup of oyster crackers, maybe, but not actual oysters <laughs> at church functions. Um, filet mignon, anyone for Christ? <laughs> All right. They demand such incredible efforts, depth beyond depth of exertion, both in degree and in duration, that the whole scale of motivation alters. Discomfort and annoyance, hunger and wet, pain and cold, squalor and filth, cease to have any deterrent operation, whatever. Death turns into a commonplace matter, and its usual power to check our action vanishes. It's like when I'm playing pickleball, I just completely forget about <laughs> Death the turns into a commonplace manner when West my heart rate. <laughs> I forget about the fact I'm on the verge of a heart attack. Um, with the annulling of these customary inhibitions, ranges of new energy are set free, and life seems cast upon a higher plane of power. So he's not going to end up praising war. Let's just keep going so we don't get that misconception. <laughs> the beauty of war in this respect is that it is so congruous with ordinary human nature. Ancestral evolution has made us all potential warriors. So the most insignificant individual when thrown into an army in the field is weaned from whatever excess of tenderness toward his precious person he may bring with him and may easily develop into a monster of insensibility. But when we compare the military type of self-severity with that of the ascetic saint, we find a worldwide difference in their spiritual concomitants. Live and let live. Did you want to stop to talk? No, about no, go, keep going. Live and let live, writes a clear-headed Austrian officer, is no device for an army, 
contempt for one's own comrades, for the troops of the enemy, and above all, fierce contempt for one's own person are what war demands of everyone. Um, this is a long quotation, by the way, right? Uh, so, yeah. So this is all the Austrian officers. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yep. Far better is it for an army to be too savage, too cruel, too barbarous than to possess too much sentimentality and human reasonableness. If the soldier is to be good for anything as a soldier, he must be exactly the opposite of a reasoning and thinking man. The measure of goodness in him is the his possible use in war. War and even peace require of the soldier absolutely peculiar standards of morality. The recruit belongs with him, brings brings with him common moral notions of which he must seek immediately to get rid. For him, victory, success must be everything. The most barbaric tendencies in men come to life again in war, and for war's uses, they are incommensurably good. Right. <clears throat> So let's see what he's going to make of that before we. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, James is saying now these words are of course literally true. The immediate aim of the soldier's life is, as Moltke said, destruction and nothing but destruction, and whatever constructions wars result in are remote and non-military. Consequently, the soldier cannot train himself to be too feelingless to all those usual sympathies. Can to be cannot train himself to be too feelingless to all those usual sympathies and respects, whether for persons or for things that make for conversation, that make for conservation. Yet the fact remains that war is a school of strenuous life and heroism, and being in the line of Aboriginal instinct is the only school that is as yet universally available. But when we gravely ask ourselves whether this wholesale organization of irrationality and crime be our only bulwark against effeminacy, we stand aghast at the thought and think more kindly of ascetic religion. One hears of the mechanical equivalent of heat. What we now need to discover is the so in the social realm is the moral equivalent of war, something heroic that will speak to men as universally as war does, and yet will be as compatible with their spiritual selves as war has proved itself to be incompatible. I have often thought that in what I have often thought that in the old monkish monkish poverty worship. In spite of the pedantry which infested it, there might be something like that moral equivalent of war which we are seeking. May not voluntarily accepted poverty be, quote, the strenuous life without the need of crushing weaker peoples. Okay, good. So it took the turn we thought it would. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it um, it's interesting because, right, Nietzsche, Nietzsche and, um, and others remind me who, but... Yes, it was very uh, popular at this time to idolize people like Napoleon, for instance. Napoleon was emblematic of what it is to be a great man for for Nietzsche, and um, that kind of. I, I mean, is it the were the Romantics also? Well, a lot of the Romantics are before, right before Napoleon. So, um, but anyway, this idea of military glory being being sort of la the last bastion of some you know something more than the life of the uh, the last man is in the air, and James is telling us it's an unacceptable solution. So we yep. should be thankful for boring church and for monkish asceticism, after all. <laughs> right. Poverty, indeed, is the strenuous life. Without brass bands or uniforms or hysteric popular applause or lies or circumlocutions, and one sees the, and, w and when one sees the way in which wealth getting enters as an ideal into the very bone and marrow of our generation, one wonders whether a, a revival of the belief that poverty is a worthy religious vocation may not be the transformation of military courage and the spiritual reform which our time stands most in need of. All right. I have a feeling he's not going to stop with poverty. <laughs> it's probably not going to be the solution. It's not going to be like a Peter Singer type thing, but maybe it will be. But he, he's, I, I don't, maybe will we end up with something aesthetic? That's the route that I thought it was going initially. And then we went on to this jag of military stuff. Well, we only have and one more page. Poverty. So, so I, we're not getting All right, too I'll far. Read, I'll read the next one. Are you ready? Yep. 
among us English speaking peoples, especially to the praises of poverty, need once more to be boldly sung. All right, we're still on this track. We have grown literally afraid to be poor. We despise anyone who elects to be poor in order to simplify and save his inner life. If he does not join the general scramble and pant with the money making street, we deem him spiritless and lacking in ambition. We have lost the power even of imagining what the ancient idealization, idealization of poverty could have meant. The liberation from material attachments, the unbribed soul, the manlier indifference, the pe paying our way by what we are or do and not by what we have, the right to fling away our life at any moment irresponsibly, the more athletic trim, in short, the moral fighting shape. The yeah. Okay. Interesting. When we are the so-called better classes, when we of the so-called better classes are scared as men, we're never scared in history at material ugliness and hardship. When we put off marriage until our house can be artistic and quake at the thought of having a child without a banking account and doomed to manual labor, it is time for thinking men to protest against so un unmanly and irreligious a state of opinion. This, this suggests a, some sort of attack on the the manliness of somebody who puts him forth politically as I'm the rich guy to say, yeah. you're a pampered little wuss. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The effeminate rich. The uh, what's the word that used to be used in politics? Uh, the elite. Um, there's an adjective that went along with the elites, though. Um, I'm just picturing little Lord Fauntleroy or something. The, the little. <laughs> uh, it's not effeminate, but it's another word in the same thing. But anyway, all right. The last paragraph. It is true. That so far as wealth gives time for ideal ends and exercise to ideal energies, wealth is better than poverty and ought to be chosen. But wealth does this in only a portion of the actual cases. Elsewhere, the desire to gain wealth and the fear to lose it are our chief breeders of cowardness and propagators of corruption. There are thousands of conjectures, no, conjunctures. There are thousands of conjunctures in which a wealth bound man, man must be a slave whilst a man for whom poverty has no terrors becomes a freeman. Think of the strength which personal indifference to poverty would give us if we were devoted to unpopular causes. We need no longer hold our tongues or fear to vote the revolutionary or, or reformatory ticket. Our stocks might fall, our hopes of promotion vanish, vanish, our salaries stop, our club doors close in our faces. Yet while we lived, we would imperturbably bear witness to the spirit, and our example would help to set free our generation. The cause would need its funds, but we, its servants, would be potent in proportion as we personally were contented with our poverty. I recommend this matter to your serious pondering, for it is certain that the prevalent fear of poverty among the educated classes is the worst moral disease from which our civilization suffers. Yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for this, and I speak as one of these cowards, but also I'm not into this romanticization of poverty and you know there were periods in my childhood for instance in which <clears throat> the concern for mere material deprivation is uh you know it's it's not a romantic circumstance it's a degrading circumstance that puts you at risk for lots of different things so um i don't know so I'm conflicted about this sort of romantic, you know, romantic riff on the virtue of poverty. So this is where I suggested we had stopped. Uh, there's another eight pages of this chapter where he actually does talk about Nietzsche on St. Linus a little bit. So we could do another session on it, or we could just say this was fine. Yeah, I'm willing to do another. Yeah. Okay. So it's like we'll reading have... a sermon. It's it's so well written and yeah so fun to read and uh i feel like it, yeah if i get enough practice i'll be speaking like a preacher before the end of it 
All right. Well, perhaps by next week, if we have time, if you have the inclination, you, we could listen, re-listen to those Nietzsche on self-denial and or the war speak one uh, right after that to be able to more explicitly connect these things up if we're going to go through the trouble. The, uh, you know, what, what, just looking ahead, I can say that even though he mentions Nietzsche, he just sees Nietzsche as condemning, you know, that, that it's just Rosantamont, that that's all it is. That's the only part of Nietzsche that he read. He did not read the thing right. that we were talking well, maybe about, it's, genealogy. Why don't you three. look and see if it's worth it before we do it, but skim it, or I can skim it, whatever. Yeah, I thought it was, it, it, it's fine. It's just, it's not a thing that is, is so in need of decoding. It's, it's almost yeah. anything else we are reading here. So yeah. it's just a matter of if we want to dwell in this space a little more and think about this. I think it's an interesting topic. I think we can give, we can add our better reading of Nietzsche yeah. okay. to, to what James has to say. It's, he's we've spent good. more time on him than James probably did. <laughs> yeah, there was, that's our ascetic quest. <laughs> yes. All right. See you all next time. Thanks. Thanks.